so uh, Piro and uh, Silver Soul are having a discussion about metaphysics, and um, I thought I'd throw my two cents into the fray. Uh, Piro was making a very sharp distinction between uh, metaphysical assertions and events and processes which can be physically ascertained and uh, measured and verified. Um, and I don't think that it's really helpful to make such a sharp uh, division between speculative thought or metaphysics and um, experiment or empirical science. I think, you know, the the activity of theory building and paradigm making is an act of the speculative imagination. Um, you know, even Karl Popper, who's famous for this notion that science, all scientific claims must be falsifiable, you must be able to prove them wrong. Even he realized, or, um, you know, tried to to make clear to people that the scientific genius makes an intuitive leap in order to devise a theory to explain the physical data. There isn't really a logical process of reasoning which would get one to a scientific theory. It's uh, an immediate grasp of the gestalt. Is, is, uh, that's what a, a scientist is doing when they're trying to develop a theory to account for data. Um, and this, this intuitive loop of imagination is precisely what metaphysics is an attempt uh, to systematize. It's, metaphysics is an attempt to systematize our intuitions. Um, and the great metaphysicians realize that all attempt at, uh, attempts at system building are um, ultimately um, impossible. The system can never be complete uh, because reality itself is creative, or at least um, from my perspective, coming out of uh, a Whiteheadian metaphysical uh, context, the ultimate nature of reality is creativity. And so, Piro, when you talk about this flow of perceptions within which we are embedded, um, that flow of perceptions is uh, what Whitehead means by creativity, too. That there's this flow of, of actual occasions, this becoming of um, real events, which are also perceptions. So, you know, his metaphysical uh, assertions are that the ultimate nature of reality is this creative flux, and that this creative flux um, has a, a self-enjoyment. It is there to itself. It experiences itself um, to varying degrees, depending on, uh, well, the more platonic side of Whitehead's metaphysics. Creativity, in general, through the process of evolution, of cosmic evolution, becomes more specific. It speciates, in other words, into various kinds of subatomic particles, and then hydrogen and helium, and then through the process of stellar formation and destruction into heavier elements, and then solar systems, and then the process of biological evolution proper begins on certain planets where the elemental composition uh, is just right, and the process of speciation continues. But there's this upward, upward trend in complexity um, what Whitehead would say is it's a the cosmic evolution moves toward both greater differentiation and greater harmony. Um, so it's in a sense after what Hegel would call the greater identity, which includes both identity and difference. So the identity of identity and difference. The universe is struggling to individuate and to come into greater communion with itself. Um, so that the one can be ever diversifying, um, that the, and, and that the many can be uh, always reaching a higher harmony, a higher unity in their collective activity. It's, um, you know, perhaps the the most fundamental metaphysical issue is this 
difference or sameness in, you know, between the one and the many. They're alike and different. They kind of depend on one another. Because what do we mean by many except uh, many individual instances of oneness? And even, you know, to, to say that there is one, the fact that we could know that implies that there is at least another. That there are two. Oneness always implies two-ness, because then what knows the oneness? So the one and the many, uh, this paradox at the base of reality, makes it so that, well, you know, for example, this artificially defined sphere of experience called sensory or physical experience uh, could never be complete in itself. Because if we're going to define the sensory over and against the mental, or define the perceptual over and against the conceptual, if we're going to dichotomize empiricism and metaphysics, then uh, our empirical experience is always going to be incomplete. And I, in responding to you, Piero, I'm always going to sound like an idealist or a Platonist, when really I, I would hope that my aim you know, my aim, as far as I can understand it, is to try to um, bring together empiricism and idealism to show that speculative thought and metaphysics are, uh, of course, always subject to the test of experience. Experience is the ultimate arbiter uh, of truth. Truth, for me, is an experience, not an abstract definition or a system. Truth is something that, if we're going to participate in, we're going to have to do it always in the moment, uh, in a living way, not in a way which could be conveyed in the form of uh, abstract information or linguistic propositions. I think metaphysical system building is, is always going to be a process um, it's incomplete um, because it always is open to the ongoing adventure of ideas, um, the ongoing uh, movement towards novelty that is the evolution of the universe. You know, our, our minds are evolving just as much as the world, and so any knowledge we have, uh, that we might come to have about the world, uh, must remain open ended. Not only because the world is changing, but because the, the nowhere itself, consciousness is evolving. And so I think, Piro, the way I'm defining metaphysics, you shouldn't have any problem with it, really. But maybe you're, you're just, you, you have an aversion to using this word because of its traditional implications. Um, and that's understandable. Maybe speculative thought, speculative thinking is a better phrase um, just to draw attention to the way in which our sensory experience of the external world is always being, if we're going to artificially define that sphere, then it's always going to be conditioned by the other artificially defined sphere that we would call mental um, or conceptual. Now, really, I think, like Whitehead, that concept and percept go all the way down. Concepts aren't just a human capacity that we project onto uh, a completely physical world. Whitehead says that even atoms are making decisions, conceptually uh, interpreting their perceptual experience based on um, certain values. Now, an atom's ability to value conceptually its perceptual experience is much more limited than a human being's ability to do this, of course. You know, an atom of, of hydrogen, let's say, usually, or almost always, in fact, follows um, the lure of a uh, gravitational gradient uh, of space-time. That's, um, you know, what it values. That's what it, that's how it interprets its experience. It feels, uh, the other hydrogen atoms around it, and in an almost um, deterministic way, almost deterministic way, it, it seeks to, to move toward the, the common center of um, all of the other atoms in its vicinity. 